Today on Newswatch, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders win in Indiana and Ted Cruz exits the race. We'll break down the huge impact of Tuesday's primary. Plus, pain reliever dangers. See why researchers are questioning the benefits of taking aspirin every day. And we're heading to the tiny nation of Georgia. It's called one of the most beautiful places on earth, but there is a fight to preserve Christianity. We'll show you why. Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Charlene Aaron. Donald Trump scored a knockout punch with an astounding victory over Ted Cruz in Indiana last night. The state was Cruz's last stand, but he was unable to deliver. That means Trump is now the presumptive Republican Party nominee for president. Gary Lane has more. Tuesday night, a subdued Donald Trump claimed a victory in Indiana's Republican presidential primary. It really looks like a massive victory and looks like we win all 57 delegates. And with Trump now only about 200 delegates away from what he needs to secure the nomination, even GOP chairman Reince Priebus tweeted Trump's the party's presumptive nominee. He said, quote, we need to unite and focus on defeating Hillary Clinton. Ted Cruz needed a win in Indiana, his last stand to stop Trump. A disappointed Cruz announced he's suspending his campaign. We gave it everything we've got, but the voters chose another path. And now it's clear that path is a Washington outsider, with Republicans preferring a non-politician, a brash and outspoken billionaire businessman over the Tea Party candidate. In New York, Trump told his supporters, America needs to win again because it's been losing all the time. We lose with our military, we can't beat ISIS, we lose with, lose with trade, we lose with borders, we lose with everything. We're not going to lose. We're going to start winning again and we're going to win big league. But the question now, can Trump win his race for the White House against Hillary Clinton? Secretary Clinton now has 92 percent of the delegates she needs to secure her party's nomination. But Democrat Socialist Senator Bernie Sanders, who upset Clinton to win the Indiana primary, said not so fast. And he said he has momentum. I understand that Secretary Clinton thinks that this campaign is over. I've got some bad news for her. But with many superdelegates already pledged to Mrs. Clinton, it seems mathematically impossible for Sanders to win his party's nomination. But he promises to stay in the race. And although their party conventions and official nominations are still more than two months away, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton will now focus their campaign efforts against one another. Gary Lane, CBN News. Target's liberal bathroom position is getting backlash from consumers. Two weeks ago, the store stated that customers and employees can use the restroom or fitting room that corresponds with their gender identity. Customer surveys from two separate research firms show Target's reputation has since fallen dramatically. You have man parts, you go to a man bathroom. and If you have lady parts, you go to a lady bathroom. More than one million people have signed a boycott petition from the American Family Association. The group says Target's policy is, quote, exactly how sexual predators get access to their victims. Well, the White House has announced a proposal to create the first national monument dedicated to gay rights. The monument would be in New York's Stonewall Inn, a gay bar recognized as the birthplace of America's modern gay rights movement. Federal officials are scheduled to hold a listening session with 9th, May 9th to hear feedback about the proposal. President Obama is prepared to recognize the Stonewall Inn as a national monument as early as next month to commemorate gay pride. While the national debt has shot up sharply in the last several months, it happened after President Obama signed a budget deal with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and then retiring House Speaker John Boehner. CNS News points out that the debt has gone up by more than $1 trillion from the end of October last year, from just over $18 trillion then to just over $19 trillion at the end of April. Although the annual federal deficit has been falling in recent years, it's expected to start rising again, and it would shoot up dramatically higher if or, it, higher if or when interest rates go up again as well. 
Well, medical errors are now the third leading cause of death in the U.S. The British Medical Journal reports that medical errors kill 251,000 people every year. And that is more than resp respiratory diseases, accidents and strokes. Medical professionals say it's more than having a bad doctor. Their survey cites a number of systemic issues that can lead to the death of someone receiving medical care. Researchers add that the study will allow institutions to find ways to improve and prevent medical errors. Well, a government panel recently recommended that some people take an aspirin a day to help prevent cardiovascular disease and colon cancer. But that's adding more fuel to the fiery debate over the benefits of aspirin and some other pain relievers. As Lori Johnson reports, for some people, they may do more harm than good. Robert Carnes is fine now, but not long ago, he panicked when he thought he was having a heart attack because his family needs him. The chest pains were pretty bad and they were really scary. As it turns out, he wasn't having a heart attack. His chest pains were caused by ulcers, brought on by taking an over-the-counter pain reliever he regularly picked up at the corner drugstore for sinus problems. That surprised me. Uh, I had no clue. <laughs> The type of pain reliever Robert took is called an NSAID, short for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. NSAIDs include naproxen like Aleve, ibuprofen like Motrin and Advil, and aspirin. NSAIDs are responsible for a reported 16,000 deaths each year and 100,000 hospitalizations from things like kidney failure, heart attack, stroke, and ulcers. So really everybody's at risk, but the people who are really at the greatest risk are those who may be taking other medications that could also interfere with the stomach. Say someone who's on a blood thinning medicine, uh, people who are on steroids for other medical diseases, uh, the elderly, people who are hospitalized, have other stresses on their intestinal system, can also be at much higher risk than the general population. Dr. Daniel Newman says Robert was wise to seek help right away and advises everyone to talk to their doctor about all the medications they're taking, even over-the-counter ones. Discuss how much you're taking, how often, and any unusual symptoms. Develop a change in the color of your stool, black, tarry bowel movements. You start to have uh, vomiting or nausea. You're throwing up stuff that looks like coffee black coffee ground like material. Even in the absence of pain, this could be a sign of intestinal bleeding and uh, stop that medication and notify your doctor right away. The good news is many of us can reduce painful inflammation a different way without taking an NSAID by switching to an anti-inflammatory diet. One that's low in sugar, white carbohydrates like bread and pasta, trans fats, also known as hydrogenated oils, industrialized vegetable oils, and chemical food additives. These highly inflammatory items are found in abundance in processed foods. On the other hand, anti-inflammatory foods are ones that are in their original state, including unrefined fats like fish oil, coconut oil, and olive oil, raw nuts, avocados, and lots of colorful fruits and vegetables. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Evangelist Franklin Graham is urging Christians to vote and run for political office. Graham made the comments in Nashville on Tuesday on his Decision America 50-state tour. He asked the crowd of nearly 9,000 people to confess the nation's sins, including abortion and the legalization of gay marriage. Graham also challenged them to consider running for public office because politi politicians today are unwilling to stand up for biblical values. Graham left the Republican Party last year and now declares himself an independent. He says he places no hope in political parties, but believes that God can still save the United States. Well, the entire Bible is being read out loud nonstop at the heart of the nation's capital this week. Volunteers take turns reading scripture at the podium day and night until Thursday, the National Day of Prayer. Here are some highlights so far from this 27th annual Bible Marathon. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Yeah. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven 
He beholdeth all the sons of men. I have a burden for our, our nation, for our, our nation's capital. And a number of years back, we got acquainted with the National Bible Reading Marathon. It is an opportunity to lift up the Word of God, the truth of God's Word, as well as exercise our First Amendment liberty. The nation is so divided on so many levels. We found that all these different denominations coming together in unity to read the Bible. We're hoping that the world will look at us and realize that the precepts of God, the precepts this great nation was based on is what we need to get back to. So we're just allowing God's written word to take precedent over 90 hours. I'm just honored to be here, honored to be in this nation, honored to call his name. Uh, there is no God but him, so it is an honor to be here. I've been here for 29 years. This is the first year I'm reading it as a citizen of U.S. <laughs> so it's an honor. It's an honor. The Lord is good in all he's doing. He's an amazing God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Coming up, it's been called a second heaven and it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. But it's had its share of turmoil too. Watch history come alive in the small nation of Georgia after this. We're going to take you to a place that very few people have heard of or even know where it is. George Thomas traveled some 6,000 miles to the tiny nation of Georgia. No, we're not talking about the state here in the U.S., but an ancient land where culture, tradition, and faith in Jesus Christ run deep. It was famed novelist John Steinbeck who, while traveling through the Soviet Union in 1947, referred to this land as a kind of second heaven. And it's easy to see why. Once part of the communist empire and often called the Riviera of the Soviet Union, the Republic of Georgia nestles between the Caucasus Mountains and the Black Sea. Turkey and Armenia flank its southern border. Azerbaijan is to the east, Russia to the north. Levan Vazadze is a Georgian businessman. I come from a very ancient, perhaps one of the most ancient cultures in the world. An ancient place where people speak a language that's over 2,000 years old. Ethnographer Luar Sab Togonitse says his is a country that has also witnessed its fair share of turmoil. Georgians go through a lot. Because of the geographical location, many armies, invaders, would pass this way. History here is measured in millennia, not centuries. And throughout the ages, your country has been the playground for numerous empires. The Ottomans, the Persians, the Greeks, the, the Byzantine Empire, the Romans, the Mongols, the Russians. In the capital city of Tbilisi, the ancient and modern mix seamlessly to create a beautiful portrait of Georgia's rich culture and traditions. One of the best ways to take in the sights and sounds of uh, Tbilisi is to take one of these trolleys up the mountain. In filming these scenes of Tbilisi and stunning countryside landscapes, Georgian cameraman Georgi Shamazana said it best. Every time I travel in different regions of my country, I feel like I'm traveling through thousands of years of history. 
Georgians are legendary for their hospitality. They believe guests come from God and as such are treated with honor. Their food mm, is simply out of this world. For example, you have this amazing dish, it's called khinkali and the all famous hachapuri. Friendship is highly valued in the society and family is paramount. But if there is one thing many Georgians cherish most, it is their faith. Vasadze says Christianity, above all else, has protected and preserved his nation. The reason Georgia remained what it is, because our nation has a profound feeling of responsibility to holding on to the eternal features of our national character, which by all means are rooted in the Christian culture. Georgia is one of the oldest Christian countries in the world. Its Christian heritage can be traced here to the small town of Mshketa. It was around 326 AD when a woman evangelist named Nino started preaching the gospel here. And the way these two rivers meet, two main rivers of Georgia, uh, there was a big baptism and it's considered to be second Jerusalem for Georgians, it's a holy place. Christianity spread to the rest of the country and in about 10 years became the state religion. Five crosses symbolizing Christianity's influence adorned the Georgia national flag. Dating back to the fourth century, the church has played a significant role in the society. In fact, about 80% of Georgians say they belong to the Orthodox Church. Georgians have always had to defend their faith, even to the last drop of blood. Iona Gamrekeli is a prominent leader in the Georgian Orthodox Church. He says over the centuries, many Christians became martyrs for refusing to renounce their faith. In 1226 alone, Muslim invaders beheaded more than 100,000 Georgian Christians. There have been numerous attempts by invading armies to force us to give up our faith, but we never back down. Ellen Kavlelashvili is curator at Georgia's National Museum. She has in her collection priceless manuscripts, rare Bibles, and other historical artifacts documenting Georgia's Christian heritage. Today, the role of Christianity is even more significant as we face new challenges. Kavle Lashvili believes her country today stands at a crossroads, with the countries of Central Asia, Russia, Europe, and the Middle East all vying for cultural and religious influence. She says tiny Georgia must once again stand to protect her heritage. I hope Georgia's example of unconditional love and dedication to faith are a testimony to all mankind. People should realize that the absence of faith is disastrous for a nation. Christianity is how we survived in the past, and it's how we will survive in the future. George Thomas, CBN News in Tbilisi, the Republic of Georgia. Up next, bringing the Bible back to life. See how an app is changing the lives of children around the world. CBN has been telling Christian stories through its animated series, Superbook. It's been around for about 40 years. It's brought the Bible to life in more than 106 countries, and it's been translated into more than 40 languages. Since it was first created, more than 500 million people have seen it. And as times have changed, so has Superbook. It's moved from the TV to the computer screen and even to an interactive app. CBN's Caleb Kinchlow spoke with the man behind the Superbook app. You're watching the digital download, and today, guys, we are talking about Superbook. Hey, Gizmo. <laughs> that's right, Ephraim. I am a fan. And if you didn't know, that's CBN's animated series, and it's more than 40 years old. Superbook brings the Bible to life in more than 106 countries, and it's been translated into more than 40 languages. Since its creation, at least 500 million people have seen it. To put that number into perspective, that's the population of Texas multiplied by 18. 
Well, as times have changed, so has Superbook. It's not the cartoon I grew up on, this VHS, believe it or not. It's now a 3D animated series, and it is available on your iPhone or tablet. It sure is. So that's why I headed over to CBN Central in Virginia Beach to find out a little bit more information about this app. Hello? Is this thing on? Why was it so important to create an app for Superbook? We wanted to take the best aspects of the Superbook animation series and integrate them into the Bible. So you, so bring the Bible to life. Uh, get to know the characters, learn more about God, learn about God's plan and His love for you and how the Bible applies to your everyday life. Mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of incredibly exciting features on the app. What are some of the most popular ones? Yeah, we, we put a lot in there. So, so there are a lot of features. It's a full Bible. Mm -hmm. So you've got the full Bible text, a lot of different languages, different versions. You can make notes, you can highlight verses, you can have your favorite. You can even upload photos. So if there's a verse about love, you can put a picture of your family in there, things like that. You can learn about the characters of the Bible, the places, the artifacts. There's a daily devotion called a daily quest. So you get a encouraging verse every day, and then you can do some fun games around it. So we've got games in there as well. You can do word searches and trivia. That's great because, you know, I've been a fan of Superbook since I was like this little. So it sounds like what the app is doing is taking what you see on the show and helping you to dive in deeper to help the kids really explore and understand. Whenever we answer a question, we have the verses and the references. So it's not just our thought about what this answer is, but it is what does the Bible say and how does that apply to you? And I think another key feature is the want to know God section. It's a very easy way to explain the gospel to kids. It is a cool app for even me, the big kid. <laughs> and you can download this app on any smartphone. Just head to the App Store and look for Superbook. Get it today. I'm Ephraim Graham. And I'm Caleb Kinchlow, and this has been your Digital Download. Operation Blessing has been helping with earthquake recovery in Japan. Last month's quake split the ground, destroyed homes, and displaced tens of thousands of people. Since then, Operation Blessing has worked with local churches and volunteers from all over the country to deliver supplies. They've also used social media to reach victims. One tweet was received from a resident on the northernmost island needing supplies for their kindergarten kids. Operation Blessing was able to deliver diapers and hygiene items and connected them with a local church. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website at ob.org. Well, that is it for now on CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at cbnnews.com. Tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do that on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day and God bless.